Shalom brothers and sisters, we are here again testing the doctrine to see whether Messiah is God and we are with Adam Drizzle and Joseph Israel. Thank you for being here today guys. I really appreciate that and I'm very excited about this. And in this video what we're going to try to be doing is to address uh, some of the main, uh, in our view, misunderstandings that uh, the Christian tradition has handed down to support the deity of Yeshua. And uh, as a disclaimer, we do believe that Yeshua is the promised Messiah of Israel, that he fulfilled the prophecies of the Hebrew prophets. Uh, we are not denying Messiah. We are simply stating that he is not Yehovah, and we believe we made it abundantly clear in the last video how uh, he himself said that he was not, and he established that clear distinction. And uh, to me, there is something, uh, you know, context is everything. And uh, we know uh, we are coming out, uh, you guys are coming out of Christianity, you know, I'm coming out of uh, Judaism, uh, you know, regarding the traditions and sticking to what is the scriptural truth, as is in the Tanakh, in the Torah and the prophets. And we know that things have to be looked at in context. So, for example, when we see that uh, Yeshua, the Messiah, said, uh, you know, the Torah and the prophets will last until heaven and earth pass away and nothing will change. If we see something coming later on, that make us believe something opposite to that simple, clear, clear, crystal clear truth, we know that we will have to understand that in the context of what he said. Or we have, for example, the vision of Peter in Acts uh, chapter 10, that he is questioning, uh, you know, some people question the, the, law, the dietary laws that are established in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus. So Yeshua said nothing will change. Now Peter gets a vision and he is pondering. What in the world does this even mean? Because, you know, I know the law and this cannot mean that I can eat this animal. So he tries to look at it in context. So everything that we will look at it uh, today uh, will have to be in the context of what we spoke in the last video. That is who Messiah said that he is himself. So I see a lot of uh, these uh, mainstream uh, Christian arguments for the deity of Messiah are single verses and sometimes even like a handful of words taken out of a context to show how he is God. So we're going to try to see that uh, in that context. Uh, and another thing is a, a lot of terminology that we will have to understand. Uh, what the words really mean. So um, what, what do you think, uh, Adam, about the uh, terms? Terms are vitally important. And I, and I believe I brought this up uh, in the last video. But anyone who does a study on this or watches video on this or, or whatever it may be is going to have to come to the table knowing that and understanding and acknowledging that the scriptures were not written in English um, and that they were not written in our culture. And, and it, you know, it does sound like, duh, you know, pretty simple logic, but most people aren't uh, willing to acknowledge that. And when it comes down to, you know, properly interpreting the scriptures, especially as it relates to topics that are as fiery as this one, um, we often do need to look into those original languages to determine whether that terminology means one thing here or another thing here. Um, anyone who's done any study in, in Hebrew, um, or even in Greek for that matter, as it relates to the New Testament, um, will understand that there's idioms, there's, there's, for lack of a better term, there's isms, Hebraisms that are in the uh, scriptures that only make sense in that context and in that culture, and in that language. And so um, there's going to be some of those phrases that we're going to need to evaluate. One big one is um, in John 1, verse 1, that most people don't recognize and don't know because it, it involves some study in, in Greek and, and the syntax. But it's a, there's 
sometimes semantics in, in certain issues when it comes to doctrine uh, is very, very important. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think um, establishing terminology, we're going to have to dig into it, um, and it, it's very, very important. And I did want to bring up one other scripture that I don't know if we brought up yesterday, or I'm sorry, in the last video, um, about who Yeshua said that he was. Um, there's a confession that I believe it was Peter that made of him when Yeshua was asking the apostles, who do you say that I am? And that's a big question right there. And this is after a certain amount of time he's been taught, and uh, Simon Peter answered, saying, you are the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. And Yeshua's response to that was, you know, basically, good job, good answer. The answer was from the Father in heaven, or from heaven, not from you. Now, that would, again, have been a perfect opportunity amongst many others that Yeshua had to say, no, you're totally wrong. Um, no, I'm, I'm the Almighty in the flesh, and, you know, but why not clarify? So, that, I wanted to bring that one back in, but yeah, terminology is going to end up being vitally important in this. I love it. I love it. That's a great point, uh, Adam. Like we were talking also about John 10 when he says uh, he had the perfect opportunity at the temple to say, you know, yes, I am the Almighty in the flesh, but he does not say that, but he rather tells them, uh, doesn't in your scripture says that you are all Elohim. Yep. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, I love that revelation from Peter. That's the true revelation from heaven is uh, spoken uh, also uh, through the letters of Paul that Messiah uh, came in the flesh. Basically, it says that Messiah came in the flesh. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I think it is good just to go ahead and start tackling uh, John because I noticed that most of the things that people take to support the doctrine of the deity come from John. And uh, if you ask, uh, you know, I, I met many Jewish believers, many, you know, people getting deep into, you know, Jewish uh, mysticism, and they will say, John was a mystic, <laughs> basically, you know, they, they will say, you know, John is like the deepest, he's talking about like Kabbalistic concepts, uh, he's talking a, a very hard to understand language, and I see that people will just take things out of context without that proper understanding, uh, and to see where he's coming from, um, and just make up this doctrine. So. It all starts in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the mm -hmm. beginning was the Word. The first thing I can say is that I noticed that the, the word Word is capitalized. What is that about? Go ahead, Joseph. Oh. <laughs> so, okay, so... Um, if you if you go to my YouTube page, I have a few videos on this already, um, and for more detail, I don't know what, how we're going to go into it today. But just basically, all, the, what we have to do is look at the Greek. Um, but yeah, I have the NRSV, um, and it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's that's the standard. You know, this is a New Revised Standard, standard Christian text, um, how it's interpreted. But when we actually look at the Greek, we see something slightly different. We see that one of the um, one of it uh, one of the part where it says it says um, in the beginning was the word. Well, so the first of all, I mean to me, in the beginning. So if you there's some we know from Moshe, we know obviously from logic that the creator of the universe has no beginning. So the fact that it just starts in the beginning means that that um, there was a time that there was a time when creation began or in the beginning that he's referring to it means that whatever he's referring to had to start and at one time didn't exist you know and that it's he's going into a very deep level of, of reasoning and understanding so I, I mean I think in the beginning was the word but then you have to look at the word is logos and in the in the Greek 
that 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 term honestly is a loaded term because it comes with a lot of Hellenism around it. And if you actually were in that day as a Greek speaking Jew or, you know, and if we're, right now we're in the time of, of the Hanukkah, the, the whole New Testament was written in a very Hellenized world. Ju Judaism and, and eventually what Christianity evolved from came out of a Hellenistic world. And we're right now fighting to return to the truth like the Maccabees did, like the, the righteous holy Kohanim in the time of the Hanukkah did. And so, you know, it's interesting. So this word logos, if you look it up in Greek philosophy, there's going to be a, a lot of different interpretations. But this was a mystical kind of term in Greek philosophy. Philo and other Jewish um, rabbis and people from Judaism were playing also around with this idea of the logos, not even in association with Yehoshua. So this was a topic in Judaism already in their, in their, in their mind. So this it's not like John's turning into a Greek here. He's actually bringing out something that was actually being talked about in Jewish circles. And, and so, but it, it's translated word. And in Hebrew, it's probably davar. It's davar. And then we see in the scriptures a lot of times that the word of the Most High, the word of the yod heh -Vav -Heh came to Moses, came to Jeremiah. So he's drawing on some intense stuff here. And, but basically it says, and the word was with, and then they just skip it, God. But actually, if you look in the Greek, it's, it has a definite article in front of God there. You know, so it should actually say the Elohim. It should say, it should, there's a distinction there. And I'll take, I mean, I'll let anyone else go from there. But there's definitely, when you look at the Greek, I'll show you guys. I have it highlighted. If you can see it. The one yep. has a definite article in front of it, and the other one doesn't. So, um, and then you have to get into, well, what, how are these phrases used? So go ahead, my brother. Yeah, so, so I'm going to go to your original question, Sidi, um, about capital letters. First of all, I think what, what most people need to understand that, that a lot don't, when they, if they don't look into the original documents, is that all Old Testament and most, uh, definitely all ancient New Testament documents are written in Greek in what's called unseals. Unseals are all capital letters. And if you've ever read a Greek manuscript such as the Codex Sinaiticus or anything like that, you're going to see three columns with capital Greek letters written in the words. There's no spaces, there's no periods, there's no nothing. So from a capital letter perspective, when you read in the beginning was the word and W's capitalized and so forth, those are purely... Uh, interpretive, you know, inserts by by the translators, um, because the Greek manuscripts absolutely do not do that. Now you'll you'll find Greek, um, you know, like the Greek New Testament you just showed there. You'll find that today that has the Greek letters capitalized at the beginning, but the original manuscripts of the New Testament did not have that. That's not how they wrote Greek back in the day. Um, right. Now, having said that, <clears throat> John one one in the Greek is very vitally important to understand. Um, as a whole, it reads in arche in halagos, which is in the beginning was the word, and then it says in halagos in prostantheon, which means in the or uh, in the word was in the word pros there is typically translated with, but it actually is more of a directional um, word, like you know how you say uh, proceed, right? The pros means toward, to or toward something, and then tan theon is the God. So, and the word was toward, or almost pointing towards, or moving in the direction of the God. Now, the third portion of that, which is John 1, 1, C, is what the scholars would say, um, is kai theos and halagos. And it's important because literally translated, it would say, and God was the word, if you translated it literally which is different than every translation that you get and also confounds the, the purpose of it. But I wanted to go into this, and I want to show this book really quick because this is very important. This book is probably the most popular or one of the most popular Greek grammars that are, that's used in colleges and universities today, uh, seminaries and so forth, when you're taking a, a New Testament Greek class. Um, Bill Mounts or William Mounts, great book. 
in chapter six, he deals specifically, and I don't know if you guys can see that, but at the very bottom there, you see Kai Theos on Halagos, where it says, and God was the word, or mm -hmm. right there? Yeah, okay. Basically, his understanding, knowing Greek as he does, is that when the verb, in this case Theos, or God, is thrown, it's swapped in position, it's thrown in front of the uh, verb, which is n, which means was, in this case, it actually changes the quality. It changes the type of statement that that is from a declarative statement, which is calling like, hey, that ball is red, or that building is tall. A declarative statement to a qualitative statement, which means that it takes a different word order in English to properly convey the message. So how one version actually puts it and how Bill Mounts actually agrees with is that it would be better to say in what God or Elohim was, the word was. Mm -hmm. So where, if, as you can see, one identifies and the word was God, the other one brings the qualities of one and associates it with the qualities of the other. So if Yah is holy and righteous and good and perfect, then his word is also holy, righteous, good, and perfect. Um, now, there's other parts when you continue through the first five verses that um, are actually very telling as to what this is referring to as well. And like I said, sometimes you have to go into the original languages to see these things. And then what about uh, when it gets to verse 14, and the word became flesh? Right. And that's actually, so that actually ties back into a couple of verses um, in 2 and 3. And I'm going to pull it up for the creatures because I want to make sure I have it right in front of me. But in verse 2, um, most translations, some translations will say he was in the beginning with God. Right? And of course, you're originally to think, well, what's he? But the, the, the word there, if you look at it there, uh, Joseph, is... Utas, and Utas yeah. is basically saying a way of saying this one or this. So it says this was in the beginning with Elohim. And now, interesting thing here: most versions in, in verse three will read, "And all things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that has been made." Um, now, several ancient versions of the Bible, pre King James, such as the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible, and I think the William Tyndale New Testament as well, translate that word, him, as it, which is another viable translation of what that word is. So think about it, if, if I read it this way instead, the first five verses. In the beginning was the word, and the word was toward the God. And what Elohim was, the word was. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made through it, and without it, was not anything made that has been made. In it was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness apprehended it not. So there you have a message that's consistent with Genesis about all things being created through the word. And then that word became the life to men, and that word is a light unto their path. That explains what you just brought up to you about verse 14, is that same word that was used to speak everything else into creation was then also spoken to bring his son into creation. Very well, very well. Uh, I think it's great. I think it's great to look into different ways of understanding instead of just staying with a plain meaning and of course going into the depth of the Greek language. You know that I, I'm not uh, as well versed uh, as you are Uh, in the Greek, but uh, of course we have that in Hebrew all the time, you know, and when people want, yeah. to, want to just take a simple understanding, it's kind of like a baby understanding, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. uh, you can understand it only um, so precisely. Um, now, moving forward, uh, people will take um, this phrase uh, when Yeshua said in John 10, and we, we touched a little bit uh, on that in last video, Uh, I and the Father are one. So does that mean that he is part of the unity of the Father? Uh, because 
some people used to believe in the Trinity. So in the Trinity, you have these three beings that they are distinctive uh, beings, but they are all one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it seems to me that many people that have already rejected the doctrine of the Trinity, now they believe in a binity and in two beings that are one instead of three, you know, not to reject the, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, you know, that we cherish, uh, you know, that's, that's how Elohim manifests in us and through us. Uh, but so now they went to these two beings uh, in big part based on this understanding from I and the Father are one. So how would you see that, guys? Um, uh, we go ahead, Joseph. Um, oh, I mean, I think it's I think it's simply put, you know, to make it as easy as possible. As we as we said last week, you know, I think we covered it really well. That he said that I and my father are one, and that he also prayed that his disciples would be one as him and his father were one, and also that everyone that would ever study the truth from them and get the truth from in this way that they would that they would all be one as him and his father are one so ultimately this again gets back to the unification of of israel and of all people of goodwill um that that should come together in a oneness because ultimately that's what we're working for we have a fractionized a divided house can't stand there's so many this sectarianism is destroying it's destroying everybody whether it's judaism christianity all this division in the world we have to dispel the the darkness and come back to the light that we should be one and who should we be one with but with the Almighty Creator and Yehoshua himself embodied that and shared that and therefore was the light. And, and we also have a chance to also shine that light and, and be a part of that oneness. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I think that's, that's, that's very good. I think that's very clear. One in, in purpose. Yes, one yep. uh, the, with the same mission. Uh, I, I'm gonna uh, step it up, uh, Adam. Uh, I'm gonna go to a big one now. <laughs> okay. Uh, in uh, in John 8, uh, 24. Okay, because I I, I see a, a lot of the comments um, that are uh, very condemning uh, in the first YouTube video. Uh, yeah. That people are saying that we will die in our sins. Um, yep. because in John 8, 24, it says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, Tzvi, <laughs> for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So I am is all capitalized, and it automatically will bring people to I am uh, of the burning bush. Ehiye, uh, asher ehiye. You know, it's something that Knowing Hebrew and thinking of Yeshua speaking Hebrew, saying this, I cannot fathom it. Because you can simply not even say I am in Hebrew. You can just say I. The, the verb uh, to be cannot be conjugated in the present tense. So even the ehie asher ehie, the I am that I am of Exodus 3, doesn't literally mean I am that I am, but more than I will be, uh, that I will be. So what in the world was Yeshua saying here? Okay, so again, this goes, this does go a little bit into a linguistics thing here, like you said. First of all, we have to at least admit to ourselves that uh, the book of John, as far as what we know currently, that we don't have any Hebrew rendition of it, and we don't have any evidence from the, quote, church fathers or anything like that to, to point us in the direction that this book was written in Hebrew at any time. Now, that's not to say that it's not, but what we have before us from a textual perspective and a historical perspective is that this book was written in Greek. So we have to move forward at least with that conclusion. Otherwise, we're, we're delving into supposition, and you can't base foundational doctrines such as something like this on supposition, in my opinion. So in the Greek there, that phrase, ego I me, literally means I am. I mean, that's how you say I am. Um, but it's also, in most translations of that particular verse, you'll see in italics, or basically that it's not literally there as the word he, it says in your sins. Um, it's important to put that distinction in there, and I'll bring this up for a couple reasons. Number one, that whole chapter there 
if you read it from starting in verse 12 all the way through the end, is a constant berating and scathing of the Pharisees that were speaking to him. I mean, think about the things that he said. He said, you, are, you judge after the flesh. My judgment's true. Um, uh, you are not of your father. You are of your father, the devil. You are from beneath. I'm from above. You are from this world. I am not of this world. I mean, he's just ripping them to shreds over and over again. Yet, for some reason, in verse 24, by the time he gets there, we don't see any phrase that says, and the Jews picked up the stones to stone him right after, and you shall die, you know, except you believe that I am he. There's no, there's no reference to the Jews suddenly picking up stones to stone him. If he said, as you, as you just said, ehyeh asher ehyeh, if he said that, he was calling himself, quote, the great I am, why wait until, you know, all these other accusations and these other statements later about Abraham and all these other things? Why wait till then to pick up stones to stone him until the very end? If it was just blasphemous to the highest degree of blasphemy to call yourself the I am, and he did it without, without question at that moment, why wait? Um, my belief, according to all of this, is at the end of this entire tirade, when he goes through this whole scathing of the Jews... Um, he hits this culmination where this man named Abraham, who these Pharisees and all the Jews at that time exalted above all of them, we are sons of Abraham. This is where our promise comes from. This is where our, our blessings come from. This is all the story and the history. Everything we have is poured out upon and through Abraham. We're called that ones according to him. Um, <clears throat> Yeshua then proceeds to exalt himself above the one they have exalted the highest in their mind, and that was the last straw for them. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, <laughs> literally, the phrase, you know, would say, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham came to be, I am He." If you wanted to translate it more accurately, uh, before Abraham was born is an inaccurate representation translation of that verb. You know, my it's in a it's in a futuristic tense. Um, so it, it's, it's more before Abraham came to be, I am he. And so I believe it's what Yeshua is talking about the whole time, is he's confessing himself and preaching himself and telling himself to be the Messiah, the one that came from heaven, his origins from up there, to be brought down to, to bring the redemption uh, of mankind. I'll bring up one other point that I think proves that this simple phrase, I am, on its own, is not enough to bring any type of conclusion whatsoever that he is declaring himself to be uh, the great I am. Um, when he is brought, uh, when, when people met him in the garden to arrest him, this is in John chapter 18, um, it says, let's see, in verse 4, it says, Yeshua therefore, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said unto them, these are the, he's saying, that it says there's a band of soldiers, officers, chief priests, and the Pharisees, not including all of his disciples with him, all these witnesses, said, uh, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua said to them, I am. Right? Boom. There it is. There's the declaration that he's the great I am. No questions, right? No. All those witnesses, again, no stones at all. And it says, Judas, who also betrayed him, was standing with them. When therefore he said to them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. And that's where I've heard Christians come up and say, oh, see, he said I am, and they spoke the words, and they fell back on their faces and whatever. But keep in mind that not hours later, hours later, we read that the priests and those who were trying Yeshua had to call false witnesses against him because they couldn't find a single witness to testify against Yeshua that was true, anything that was wrong. Now, if you had the, the officers, the chief priests, the Pharisees, all the disciples of Yeshua all there at one time, how in the world could you possibly have to call false witnesses to testify to him calling himself the Elohim of, of creation? You wouldn't have to do that. Everyone there would have heard it. There's nothing to this phrase, I am, inherently, that means he's calling himself the great I am. That's a good point. Yeah, I have to agree with that. And um, another point I have here 
uh, as a title, it says, only God can be worshipped. And Yeshua was worshipped. It says, so, so what, what does that mean? Uh, so we have one, uh, two, two passages. One uh, in Matthew, it says that, uh, you know, the wise man that came from the east came to baby Yeshua uh, to worship him. Now, was did that mean that he was Elohim? Uh, and then uh, at the end, after the, the resurrection, uh, in, in Matthew 28, it says that when uh, the women came to the tomb uh, and Yeshua met them and he said greetings, they came to him, uh, clasped his feet and worshipped him. And I will tie this in together with another controversial passage uh, when he presents himself to the disciples and uh, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Uh, so we have there three uh, problematic uh, passages. Joseph, would you like to tackle that? Uh, yeah, I'll touch it a little bit. If you okay, so first of all, um, this is a good, helpful tool. But you can also this is the Hebrew Shem Tov text, and you can look. I didn't look at all the other Hebrew uh, Matthew manuscripts, but you, you don't need this. You can also use the Greek manuscript. Um, but this is basically the same story in Hebrew, and and basically with Matthew, we're going to deal with Matthew and the wise men. Uh, is it is it is it the magicians or however you want to say it the wise men from the east worshiping they say the child but if you actually look at it, it though this word it's all about the context and what we find is the word in Hebrew that's used in the Hebrew Matthew also in the Greek text if you go back in the Septuagint the Tanakh the Old Testament and you trace these words back you find that it's consistent both ways whether you go the Hebrew text all the way back into the Septuagint, or you take the, the Hebrew Matthew and you go onto the Masoretic text that before that that Nathan the prophet bowed down to King David this way. That the the that many people it's a way to show honor to someone that you recognize as authority. It's understood in the con that, that no one would just someone recognizing someone as an authority from the creator and and in a sense it just means simply bowing down there's they were not worshiping him that you know any more than nathan was worshiping king david and if you look into the text you have to look at the context of how this word's used and though in a sense you can bow down to the creator of the universe it's got to be in the context and so israelites prophets inspired people bow down to other kings of israel in, in ancient times, and I think it's no different how these people bowed down to Yehoshua, who they saw to be Mashiach, which actually means the anointed king of Israel. And so, um, you know, that's for that one. Yes. I mean, you have to do a word study. Uh, yeah, I believe yeah. the word the word you are uh, speaking in Hebrew, Lehishtachavot, uh, Lehishtachavot, Mishtachave, uh, and it came to my mind, that's also what... Uh, Moses did when he saw Jethro coming in the wilderness. It says he came and he uh, bowed down, or sometimes they say to uh, pay uh, obeisance. Um, so that's another yeah. word. That doesn't mean that he, they are the most high. Yes, Joseph. And also when, when Abraham was, you know, when Abraham was buying the, the cave at Machpelah, mm. you know, from the Canaanites, yep. It, 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 he bowed to them. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. So. And and uh, yeah, I think it is important too. Uh, again, from a semantics and a, and a word meaning perspective here, uh, it, it's important to know. Like you said, even the if we took it strictly from a Greek text perspective, the Greek word that's translated there is pros kuneo, and there you have that word pros again, uh, which means to or toward, and kuneo actually means to kiss. So it is. It's as if you were to think about um, in ancient times, if you were to bow down your knee before a king and he extends his hand like this to kiss the signet ring of his hand. It's a sign of reverence and worship in the sense of exalting someone to, to the position that they are. 
not the position that you want them to be. So um, when, again, going back into the Old Testament, like uh, Joseph brought up, uh, the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, if you look at that same passage you're talking about, Abraham was buying, bowing down to the sons of Heth. Mm-hmm. Of course, in the English, it's going to say that they bowed down. Why? Because the translators didn't want to translate that word there as worship, because they know in English, worship is implied typically to mean worship of the one true Elohim. So in that instance, they're going to tra- translate that verb bowing down. But in other instances, according to their own doctrinal bias, uh, it's they're going to translate it as worship. So if you translated it consistently and looked at worship, then it would say that Abraham, this righteous man who was called out by the Father to bring it, you know, to basically start a new nation, the Hebraic nation, bowed in worship to the sons of this foreign nation that worship a foreign Elohim. No, it it what it means is he was showing them the sign of respect that they were due. He was paying them the greatest respect, just as I would, if I were standing before Yeshua myself right now, I would proskuneo to him, per se, because I would bow down by myself down to my king. That does not by any means, uh, again, cannot be stretched to mean that that word is solely uh, reserved for the worship of the one true God. Exactly. Yes. And I hope that people can understand that we are not trying to take any merit of what Yeshua did. Uh, You know, we hold him in the highest esteem uh, for what he did. uh, And we believe that the mission that he came for and, you know, he willingly paid the highest price for his people. um, And, um, you know, he, he received a great reward for that. Uh, and uh, we believe that he is the Messiah of Israel, but that does not mean that he is Jehovah, the Creator. But the Creator created him for a purpose. He w- was born as a man, and that's what it makes it so powerful. Uh, he was a man, and he was able to uh, overcome all temptations and uh, yeah. do what he did. So. Uh, we have a couple more things. I don't know that we are going to be able to touch on all of them. We may have to talk uh, about doing another video, um, but I think we we went through a, a few of the hard ones. And um, also, I want people to understand that uh, you know we haven't gotten everything figured out. Uh, we think that some things are very clear and some things that are misunderstood are also very clear you know many people that came out of religion to embrace uh, torah uh, they will very easily um, uh, debunk you know a christian coming and saying you know the law was done away with and you know and they will be like well, that, that is easy you know go to matthew 5 17 you know yeshua said uh, until heaven and earth pass away, not, not one jot or tittle will pass away and can give them 20 different verses because they have it clear. So I think we are coming from there. Um, you know, it's not that we got everything figured out, but some things are very simple and we see clearly how they are taken out of context and even contradict things that Yeshua said about himself as we spoke in the last video. So here is another one. Emmanuel. What about Emmanuel, uh, God with us? That comes from a prophecy that may, uh, or some people argue that it may not be linked to uh, Yeshua's birth because uh, in the context of, of Isaiah 7, is talking about, uh, you know, it's at the time of King uh, Hezekiah, but in the Gospels that is quoted. Uh, about Emmanuel. So what do we do with Emmanuel? That means God with us. That's, that means that uh, Yeshua is Yehovah. I'll, I'll jump in with uh, something very short here really quick, and then I'll let you dig in, Joseph, as deep as you want to go. I'll just say that Hebrew names have uh, meaning, and uh, some names for people that you that were righteous were named things that you would have no clue why their parents named them that (laughs) Uh, because of a situation or whatever that's going on in their country at that time. Um, One word, though, one name comes to mind, 
uh, Jehu, or Yehu in um, Hebrew. It's the name of a king. And in Hebrew, it would literally mean Yah is he, or he is Yah. Now, no one's going to call King Jehu Yah. So why should we pull that concept over with Immanuel? Go ahead, Joseph. Okay, great. Um, well, first of all, we have to, why, why Matthew or Matthew why he put that in there, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of debates, and especially right now, people that are really testing the New Testament hard, and maybe some of them are even turning away from Yeshua because of the, the anti-missionary, there's a lot of anti-missionary um, information out there. And honestly, you know, if, if I'm not against those brothers either. Like, I love them. I think we should test everything as hard as we can. And, 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 and we, what we need to do is stop this Christian-Jewish debate back and forth. Back. What we need to do is every, if everybody says, look, let's look at the scriptures, let us pray. And, and, let, if, and this is what I think we're all here to do is say, look, we are here to celebrate the one true Elohim. This is the one that Yeshua prayed to. This is the one that we pray to. This is the one that Moshe prayed to. This is the one we're all supposed to serve. We're coming together. He's gathering his people back together. The, Judaism, Christianity are, are things that happened over the past 2,000 years, basically, and we need to come back to the truth and there's, you know, and, 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 you know, and try to respect everybody. So Christianity, Messianic, all that stuff, they got to let go of some things. Also, Judaism, there's a lot of anti, there's a lot of ways to look at scriptures based on how that Christianity has attacked them over the years and they have these defenses. But are they all exactly correct and the only way to look at it? And do you test your own religion as hard as you test the scriptural validity of Christian doctrine versus their text? You know, but so look at your version of Judaism and test it according to the Tanakh as hard as you do the, the you know, the, the whole idea of Yehoshua or, you know, and, and I think you'll begin to see there's also some things that crept into Judaism over the past 2,000 years that aren't lining up with the Torah and the prophets. And this is out of full respect and love for everybody. I'm not here to judge anybody or condemn anyone. I'm here to exalt the creator of the universe and lift up my brothers. In short, Emmanuel means El is with us. Matthew wrote this there. Matthew was a Yehudi. He saw this prophecy as very deep. Why it's put there? We know one thing, Yehoshua was never called Emmanuel. He never was called that. So what is he saying there? We need to look at deeper in and see that it says, it says, I'm gonna read it from the JPS. Look, the young woman is with child. This is from Isaiah 7, 14, and about to give birth to a son. Let her name him Emmanuel. It's interesting because it's Imanu, and in the Hebrew, it's the L is separated. You know, it's not like one how it's written in English, but it means God is with us. By the time he learns to reject the bad and choose the good, people will be feeding on curds and honey. You know, that, and before, before the lad knows to reject the bad and choose the good, the ground whose two kings you dread shall be abandoned. And Yehovah will cause to come upon you and your people an ancestral house such as days have never come since Ephraim turned away from Yehuda that self-same king of Assyria. And in that day, and it starts to go on, so this is a huge prophecy. So what I'm going to say is this. Ultimately, the whole blessing of the Torah, the whole everything, the whole idea of Mashiach and Judaism must agree is to bring Emmanuel, that, that, that the Almighty would be with us all. And so with, the, with Matthew, he perceived Yehoshua as being the Mashiach that was promised and was born. He's bringing about the con the idea the full blessing of Emmanuel he's not that's not necessarily his name but he's going to usher in this time of redemption and the, and and if you look in Isaiah 8 this is just i mean this is a deep topic obviously but Isaiah 8 says actually would you one of you brothers read it Isaiah 8 verse 8 um in the JPS so i don't know if it's the same in the english um uh, Maybe maybe you could read it in the yeah. Hebrew. Do you, do you oh, have okay. it? And maybe you could read it in the English. Um, and then, you know, we could go back just to show how this word is also used there in the next chapter. Okay. In the King um, James, uh, Isaiah 8, 8, and he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck and the stretching out of the wings. 
shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. <laughs> so it's there. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, basically... God is with it, us. Basically, is yeah. With us. Mm -hmm. So if... It, it, yeah, so it's yeah. not... It's a deep concept. It doesn't just mean in like the simple way of Jehu, you know, or, or Yehu. Um, it's just simple. Yes. Yeah. And also another I, thing to understand, sorry, uh, Adam. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And also I realized that we didn't touch on that with the Thomas thing, okay? That the word okay. El, as well as the word Elohim, is not necessarily Yehovah. So in this context that we were reading in Isaiah, is obviously talking about the Creator, uh, that El is with us. But in other contexts, the word Elohim can be used for a man. It means a mighty one, a person of authority, a leader. Uh, so uh, Moshe is said to be the Elohim to Aaron. Uh, and uh, Elohims were called leaders, the sons of Elohim can also is understood in many contexts uh, or by many commentators as the sons of judges or noble or important people. So to say for Thomas, uh, you know, my Elohim is not necessarily saying Yehovah. Uh, yeah. uh, and, you know, not taking into account that also you can say, oh, my God. God, you know, sometimes I will just say something outrageous and my wife will say, my God, and I say, no, it's okay, you know, you yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I humble myself, but, you know, it, so it, it doesn't have to uh, be, um, you know, so, so dramatic. Yes, Adam. Yeah, even um, as it relates to that passage, um, even Christian trinitarian commentators when you read and i don't have their names in front of me i had a, something pulled up with it at one point i'll see if i can find it but you can read christian commentators that are self-proclaimed trinitarians that believe obviously in the whole heart you know wholeheartedly that yeshua is the almighty in the flesh that will that will themselves say that it, it is highly unlikely that thomas a a at this at, up to this point a very strictly monotheistic Jew who had no concept at this moment of the Messiah, the promised Messiah to come would be God in the flesh. Um, one of the people actually says that it was, it's unlikely to believe that Thomas went from a state of full and complete doubt of his simple, you know, of his resurrection to the highest elated state of theological understanding that he was the almighty God in the flesh within a split second. Um, and I, and I agree with that. So, you know, I don't, I don't think that, that there is no way that that scripture, knowing what we know about linguistics, even the word theos in Greek, similar to Elohim, is not applied strictly to the one true God. It's applied to, to, to Herod, I believe, one time, Herod Agrippa. I think Paul is actually even proclaimed at one point, like when they looked at him and he said, oh, this man must be a god. Like, you know, they saw him with their own eyes. It's, it's used as a, as a term of, um, of, like you said, of, of reverence, of one of great power, and where uh, Thomas might not have had someone in his life at this point that he called his master exalted at this point, he certainly did after he saw Yeshua. Uh, I, I would like to say, yeah, the context of this is if, if Yeshua had been resurrected from the dead, he didn't even believe that he, he was like, unless I see the wounds... There's no way I'm going to believe. He's known as Doubting Thomas. He's like, look, man, our master, our rabbi is gone. We thought he was Mashiach. He failed to fulfill the mission of Mashiach. I'm not going to believe it. You guys are coming up with some story. He didn't believe his brothers, if, that, that his teacher ha had been resurrected from the dead. It, and this is so powerful that the doubt, like one thing I always get told is like the New Testament makes everybody look perfect. Like they just had perfect faith and there's all this... No, these people doubted. He doubted, like, this is really a hard thing to understand. And so when he sees it, when it happens, and he says, you know, my Lord and my God, or, you know, he could have been, he could have just said, like, Baruch Hashem, like, give thanks to the Most High that, that he has seen this. Or he could have said, I, you're my teacher. You know, he could have been, and, and he could have said, 
my master, and then he could have blessed up the creator of the universe. But it, regardless, the context is not if he believes that Yehoshua is the creator. And I think John, how it's written at the end of that ver chapter, says very clear, 30 and 31, to be, to be sure, Yeshua also performed many other signs which the before the disciples, which are not written down in the scroll. So this is chapter 20, verse 30, now 31 of John. But these things have been written down so that you may believe that Yeshua is Hamashiach, that he is the Messiah, the son of Elohim. And because of believing, you may have life by means of his name. It, <laughs> if you it, don't add anything more to it, that's it. That's it. That's what he's, yep. that's why this book was written. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just for reference, so you can have that reference for anyone who's watching this. Um, there's a, a, a work called Concessions of Trinitarians. Um, Mika, M Michael, I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> Michael I.S. is that the Michaelis is a Trinitarian. And his exact phrase is, I do not affirm that Thomas passed all at once from the extreme doubt, extreme of doubt to the highest degree of faith and acknowledged Messiah to be the true God. This appears to me to be too much for the then existing knowledge of the disciples, and we have no intimation that they recognize the divine nature of Messiah before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So even Trinitarians are divided on this point um, to believe that suddenly Thomas proclaimed this great thing. Um, so we can't take that as a, as a, again, a fact alone by itself. Good, my brothers. We are running out of time, and uh, I have to tell you that uh, it's an honor and a privilege to do this with you. Uh, you know, you are a, a fountain of uh, not only information but also words of life. Uh, I really appreciate your your humility and, and uh, you know your spirit of uh, truth seekers, uh, because that's what we're doing, and we will continue to do that. Regardless, whatever people may say or may think, we will continue to question and seek the truth. And uh, we invite people to respectfully uh, answer to anything uh, that we have been talking about uh, in the comments below. And uh, we will consider uh, doing another video. Will you guys be up for that? Absolutely. Count me in. All right, guys. Yeah, bless you. And see you yeah, next bless time. Bye-bye. Shalom. Shalom, shalom.